Remember when Diablo Immortal was debuted at QuakeCon and Blizzard fans lost their minds? Well, for once, it appears that fan outcry has resulted in some encouraging results. Good morning, good Tuesday morning to you. I'm Shane Satterfield from Sifted, and this is Good Morning Gaming for April 25th, 2022. If you'd prefer to consume the show the way it's intended, in a podcast feed so you can listen on your phone as you get ready for work or on your commute, Head to patreon.com slash sifted and drop us a pledge. It's free on our YouTube channel for everyone else, but you're going to have to watch some ads. You can find our flagship show Game Face by searching your favorite podcast service. Please give the show a review if you can. It makes a big difference for us. So Diablo Immortal made plenty of Blizzard fans angry when it was debuted at QuakeCon 2018. Not because they didn't like the look of the game. No, it was mostly because it was a mobile game and not for PC and consoles. Blizzard had hyped them up by sharing beforehand that there would be info on a new Diablo game, and then they felt betrayed when it wasn't Diablo 4. At the time, I thought the way fans reacted was embarrassing. After all, Blizzard hadn't promised anything specific. Fans just made assumptions, and you know what they say about assumptions. In that week's episode of Game Face, I railed on the audience at the event and thought they looked immature and childish. And to be honest, I still think that way. But at the same time, their immature outbursts have achieved some results. So today, Blizzard announced that Diablo Immortal will be launching on iOS and Android and PC on June 2nd. That's right. Thanks to fans getting testy, Blizzard went back and built the game for PC, and now they're launching on the same day. Better still, both versions launch complete with crossplay and cross-progression. You can play it on the go on your phone, then go home and finish off your session on your PC. So this has been a triumph of fan outcry, but I still don't want to encourage it. The gaming industry is littered with fan outbursts that haven't ended well. This is definitely an anomaly. The lead developer of Firefall essentially designed the game based on fan feedback. Do you even remember it? Elite Dangerous fumbled around listening to the community and only once it broke away and did its own thing did it become a real success. Then there's Wildstar, the MMO that listened to its beta players when they asked for it to be more of a grind. They wanted it to be like a vanilla World of Warcraft. The studio listened, and it was converted to free-to-play in less than a year, and the company shut down a couple years later. Not coincidentally, around the same time that Blizzard launched its own version of vanilla World of Warcraft. To be honest with you, I'm kind of surprised that Wildstar lasted as long as it did. Some would argue that Star Citizen, a game that may never be released, is plagued by fan interference. There are people who have invested more than $100,000 into that game. A lot of them. And they still can't really play the game. And I'll be honest, hell, if I spent tens of thousands of dollars on ships for a game that may never be completed, I might be really demanding too. I might feel like I have some agency over how that game ultimately turns out. But what happens when you do that is that the people who only have $10 in the game end up with a game that they don't want to play. This also happened with Valve's Artifact, a game that was driven to meta madness by its hardcore users to the point where everyone else just quit and gave up. It got to the point where each match took forever because the hardcore fans were the ones driving its design and not the people who are going to play casually and in all honesty, with most games, make up the vast majority of the player base. In all, the list of games that were completely screwed up by fan input is long and varied. So, do I regret digging into Blizzard fans for acting like nitwits? Not one bit. Did their disruptive behavior result in a better outcome? Absolutely. But this sort of behavior rarely ends well, so let's allow the pros to do their jobs. And now for a couple more stories from the top of your sifts. The new season of Respawn's Battle Royale launches on May 10th. Called Apex Legends Saviors, it includes a new playable legend with a portable shield named Newcastle. The rank system is also overhauled to reward teamwork and skill, and of course, there's a new battle pass to work through. There's also a new addition to the Stormpoint map that I won't spoil. At this point, 
Apex Legends is probably the industry standard when it comes to the Battle Royale genre. While Call of Duty Warzone 2 isn't rumored to be released until next year, it appears it will be revealed well before then. As part of Activision's financials, the publisher confirmed a new Warzone experience is being revealed later this year. Activision essentially confirmed suspicion that Warzone 2 has been built from the ground up on a brand new engine that should be able to scale for Battle Royale much easier than the prior engine that was being used. According to Sony, PlayStation 5's variable refresh rate support is launching this week. This uncapped frame rate option has been a long time coming, and it will debut in Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, Spider-Man Miles Morales, Resident Evil Village, and more. Once installed, variable refresh rate will automatically be enabled for supported games if the console is connected to an HDMI 2.1 compatible display. It can also be disabled under system settings. You can experiment with turning it on in games that don't technically support the feature. With it enabled, scenes should render seamlessly, graphics should look crisper, and input lag should be reduced. Well over a dozen games are scheduled to be patched with the feature in the coming weeks. The Super Mario Bros. animated movie that was supposed to be released this holiday season has been pushed into 2023. More specifically, it's now launching into theaters April 7th, 2023. The new launch date is now April 28th in Japan. Shigeru Miyamoto left a note on Nintendo's official Twitter account that reads, quote, This is Miyamoto. After consulting with Chris Son, my partner at Illumination on the Super Mario Bros. film, we decided to move the global release to spring 2023. My deepest apologies, but I promise it will be well worth the wait. End quote. That's two big Nintendo delays in the last couple weeks after the sequel to Breath of the Wild was pushed into next year as well. And can we just talk a minute about how we never hear from Miyamoto about video games anymore? It's always this cultural stuff, this shoulder programming, if you will, around Nintendo's products. It just feels like a huge waste of talent to me. But if that's what Miyamoto wants to do at this point in his career, let him do it. In today's I Can't Believe They're That Stupid story, Russia's propaganda machine was exposed today when it accidentally included copies of The Sims 3 video game in a setup photo that was supposed to expose Nazi assassins from Ukraine who were plotting to kill a Russian TV presenter. I know that's a lot. <laughs> However, it appears Putin's puppets got their wires crossed, and instead of buying three SIM cards for cell phones, the bungling idiots bought The Sims 3 video game instead. It fits right in next to the other staged items like a large swastika t-shirt and a picture of Adolf Hitler. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. The really sad part is that this pathetic attempt at a setup will undoubtedly convince some Russians that their army is really trying to root out Nazis in Ukraine. It's like something straight out of Benny Hill. Pathetic. <laughs> Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll tackle today's boss fight. Welcome to today's boss fight, where I discuss topics that may or may not be related to video games. We were all shocked at how many good games were released in February and March, and it looks like we're not alone. Several of them have completely tanked. The MPD sales report for March 2022 is in, and for the second month in a row, Elden Ring has taken the top slot. It won February despite being on sale for just a few days, but it was dominant in March. Gran Turismo 7 lands in the second slot, while Kirby and the Forgotten Land takes third. Most surprisingly, despite being available for free on Game Pass, MLB The Show 22 lands at fourth, with basically all its sales coming from the premium edition. Horizon Forbidden West comes in at fifth, which has to be a major disappointment in just its second month on sale, especially considering it was also released for PS4 in addition to PS5. WWE 2K22 debuted at number 7, Final Fantasy Origin takes the 10th spot, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands appears on the chart for the first time in at 11th, while Ghostwire Tokyo debuts at 12th, and Triangle Strategy's first month on sale lands it at 16th. 
Those last four games are basically bombs. Perhaps the publishers should have been a little smarter with spreading their releases out. Overall, eight new games made the top 20, but sales were down a whopping 15% year over year. We understood sales dropping in 2021 after the quarantine year of 2020, but this is beginning to become a pattern. Most of the sales drop is attributed to hardware though, which means both Sony and Microsoft are still struggling to fill the channels with enough PS5 and Xbox Series consoles. We doubt there's any relief immediately in sight. Speaking of which, Xbox won both March and the first quarter in hardware dollar sales, while Nintendo sold the most units for both time periods. But what I really want to discuss here is the absolute overload of big budget games that were released in a very short period of time. The market was just flooded with big games and it appears that almost all of them suffered save for Elden Ring. But few people could have really seen that one coming, so I don't blame Sony for releasing Horizon Forbidden West in the same month, but it's undoubtedly crushed the sales of the long-awaited PlayStation exclusive. Meanwhile, we're sitting here going on two months in a row without a single big game being released. Imagine if Tiny Tina's Wonderlands or Ghostwire Tokyo released this month instead of in March, or even better, if one of them released this month and another next month. I find it hard to believe that they would be sitting at the 11th and 12th spots. Which brings up a big question you may be asking. Do video game companies work together to find advantageous release windows? The answer is no, but maybe they should. The problem is that there's this perspective that a sale for your game is a lost sale for mine. It may be erroneous in the modern age, but that's how publishers operate. I've learned this talking to PR and marketing people late night at review events after they've had a drink or five. They even feel like they're competing against games in other genres for every dollar. So no, they don't work together, but that doesn't excuse poor planning. Release calendars are public knowledge and not many of the games released over the last couple months have come as a surprise. Dying Light 2 is another example. It released in February and debuted at number four and now it's completely out of the top 20 in March. It was outsold in March by old games like Madden. It simply got lost in the shuffle and really, it's inexcusable. In a time where publishers are releasing fewer games than ever and budgets are soaring, a game completely tanking simply can't happen. Watching these publishers needlessly bunch all their games into a six week period, followed by two months of empty release calendars doesn't help anyone. And it certainly won't help the publishers greenlight more single player games that have a shorter shelf life. Look at Ghostwire Tokyo. Not a great game, but a solid game. Built by Mikami's Underlings, their first game that they really took the reins on, it was a high quality game. A little repetitive, short, and the world very samey. But it was fun, at least for the first handful of hours. There's, there was some promise there is what I'm getting at. It deserves to sell better than it did. And now I guarantee you there will never be a sequel to Ghostwire. Ghostwire Los Angeles is not going to happen. Now, I don't feel quite as bad about Final Fantasy Origin. That is one of the weirdest games that I have played in a really long time, but it still has the Final Fantasy name. I cannot remember the last Final Fantasy game that was a brand new game and it wasn't a remaster or a remake or whatever. A brand new Final Fantasy game debuting so low in the charts. It just doesn't happen. And it wouldn't have happened to this game either if it hadn't have been launched in a month with four or five other gigantic games. If that game were to come out this month or next month, I guarantee you if the game came out next month, it would be in the top three easily. It's just awful planning. Dying Light 2 is a great game. I like it a lot. In fact, I'm just going back now and trying to finish it, and I am still really enjoying it. It was fourth in its first month, and now it's completely gone off the charts. People have forgotten about it. Now, a lot of people may be sitting there listening to this and saying, Shane, it's all because of Elden Ring. Elden Ring did this. No, it did not. Elden Ring obviously sold very well. Its Metacritic was a 9.7. So a lot of people who are like, hmm, all these games look kind of cool. I don't know which one to buy. The 9.7 definitely got them to buy that game. 
But if you had scheduled some of these other games away from just Horizon Forbidden West, because you knew, you knew at the very least that game was going to sell a lot. So even if you just get out of the same month as Horizon Forbidden West, you're doing your game a better service. You have a better chance for success. So what is the answer to this? I think a lot of this comes down to hubris. These game publishers and these developers think that their games are the best. And I do admire that on some level. You need to be confident in your products, particularly when in a lot of cases you spent over $100 million to create that product. So confidence is good. And that does kind of come out through your marketing and through your interviews if your team is confident that it's built a great game. But don't be foolish. Don't allow the hubris to completely crash and burn a franchise. Now, Techland doesn't have a lot of franchises, so do I think we'll see a Dying Light 3? Absolutely. Do I think we'll see a sequel to Final Fantasy Origins? No, I do not. <laughs> Am I upset about that? Not particularly. It was pretty fun to play, but it was pretty dumb in general. But it still could have sold much better, and then the prospects of a sequel and improving upon what was there would be a possibility. But now, there's no chance. So, I don't know what it was about the early part of 2022 where all these publishers felt like they had to jam so many games into such a short period of time, but now we're looking at the middle of the year and it is just a barren wasteland. And there's no way that you can convince me that if they had not scheduled these games a little more intelligently, that all of them would have done a lot better. Thanks for listening to Good Morning Gaming. I appreciate every single one of you who listens to GMG. I'm Shane Satterfield. Follow me on Twitter at Dinfire and follow Sifted at Sifted Games. While you're at it, head over to patreon.com slash sifted and drop us a pledge. The show will be back tomorrow, but until then, make sure you seize today because there will never be another.